two things influenced this shakedown. Number one, this week's Chris Harris drive video showing him about town and track with the McLaren MP4-12C and its hydraulic active suspension. And number two, one year ago today, save one day, I started that shakedown with the exact same two things influenced this shakedown words. That show was all about the F1 tech transferring into road cars, just like the active hydraulic suspension in this newest McLaren road car. Commenter Doc Wolf added inspiration with his snarky cross-reference to hydraulic suspensions in the 1960s Citroën DS and SMs and the 1950s Packard Caribbean Cruisers. Even in Matt Farah's Monday show about the 700 horsepower tuned BMW M3, that factored in. As there was this whole discussion about how the power was or was not overplaying the E92 chassis, an M3 is stuffed with active assist, dynamic stability control, M dynamic mode, electronic damping, the variable M diff, and traction control. So all in, I knew where today's show had to go. Interesting tidbits about active suspension in racing to give the Chris Harris McLaren video some racing context. By the way, in the video, Chris also said this. Strange, fascinating, complex, brilliant, frustrating. Wow, <laughs> who asked him what it's like to work with me? The McLaren MP4-12C has the most racing-derived technology of any road car ever. Well, that may not be true, but I've been watching the Harris and Farah videos very closely to learn how they're so good. And the over-the-top platitudes, I mean, I'm showing you the most awesome thing in the world you can't see anywhere else definitives, seem to be part of the roadmap to their success. Oh, am I giving away too many drive secrets? Point is, true or not as to having the most F1 tech in the MP4-12C, this McLaren certainly does get its suspension design from Racing Heritage. Not this MG liquid suspension IndyCar from way back 1964, five and six. This was not a factory effort, but the epiphany of a West Coast MG dealer and well-known race car builder, Joe Huffaker. The intent was to highlight the performance of the MG 1100 hydroelastic suspension and help sell more MG cars. It was the first time a production suspension was built into an IndyCar. The advantage was supposed to be balanced to allow the tires to achieve uniform wear. The three MG race cars were gonna eliminate tire changes during the 500. But like many things in racing, theory and practice often conflict. I've left a link for you to read if you wanna know more. And it was not this 1981 Brabham F1 car, the BT49C, with its hydropneumatic suspension. This was built to not only help the race car be better by lowering and leveling the car on track, but to sidestep the rules that banned side skirts touching the track for aerodynamic undertray sealing by raising the car when it returned to the pits, where the scrutineers check for legality. Yep, looks okay to me, it's not touching. See, it was all legal because downforce lowered the car, check valves kept it low on track, and a microfilter let the hydraulics raise the car when going real slow, like back to the pits. Brabham, by the way, was owned by Bernie Ecclestone at the time, so you figure out the story there. No, you have to look to the Lotus F1, the real Lotus, not this stuff from the past few years. And again, 1981. Lotus, with all its aero knowledge, knew that suspensions had to control the platform to stabilize it and to maximize aerodynamic performance, just like with today's F1 designs. But now teams are doing with hydraulic fluid inerters, a shock-like part that also offsets motion and mass transfer. Inerters are rules legal. It's a rules legal form of active suspension and mass motion control, I think which is why we're gonna do a Skype with Scarbs F1 blog writer, Craig Scarborough, our real racing tech guru. He's agreed to do it, we're just picking the right time. So back to the Lotus in 1981, when they started researching active suspension. By 1983, Lotus had Nigel Mansell run a few races with it. it wasn't competitive, but Nigel proved that the active suspension could withstand 180 mile an hour racing abuse and 3G laterals. Development continued. And Active reappeared in 1987 when the Honda-powered 99T Lotus won three races in the hands of Ayrton Senna. Now this 1987 car was pretty much where the McLaren MP4-12C is today. Computer controls, sensors around the car collecting data, hydraulic actuators doing the dynamics control versus traditional shocks, springs, and stabilizer bars. That Lotus read 87 parameters to create the inputs to manage ride height and suspension performance. God knows how many parameters this McLaren is reading. I mean, Chris, do you know? Here's an interesting bit of Lotus 99T video. One of the inputs with airspeed via pitot tubes. 
At high speeds, the hydraulics need to push back against the downforce to maintain ride height. At low speeds, not so much. So here's a crew guard blowing into the Lotus pitot tube. Now I do not want to see any jokes about this in the comments section. Rick Santorum would not approve. Back to the racing. By 1991, Williams F1 took the active suspension mantle. Second in the F1 World Constructors Championship, but really, with its 1992 driver and constructor P1, the Williams FW14, designed by one Adrian Newey, took active suspension to its highest racing levels. Then in the 90s, active computer control suspensions were banned. And if you've seen the Senna film, you know all about how he moved to Williams just as the rules cost that team their advantage. But the point is this, all that past F1 work got McLaren and their supplier Tenneco to go in this direction with the MP412C suspension to find the ultimate chassis performance in any situation, in any environment, with any driver of any caliber to create a massively versatile and extremely fast driving experience as Chris Harris presented to you. And that's just the suspension. We haven't even touched on the racing lessons learned and outlawed in racing, but still applied to the McLaren and other road cars such as active aero, brake performance, gearboxes. I read the Matt Farrow defense of paddles for fast driving versus the flappy paddle laments from those Clarkson Coulters. Low weight and high strength materials, turbos, engine management, and more computers in dynamic controls and in design itself. Hey, even Morgan is embracing the tech that's available today. McLaren did it with the MP412C and it's all good. Check the links for additional background info. Subscribe here and comment. Follow us on Twitter at Drive and follow me on Facebook and Twitter. I'm not hard to find. Oh, this weekend, the first rally for the Intercontinental Rally Challenge in the Portuguese Azores, the Bathurst 12-hour GT race in Australia, and something's going on in the Daytona Beach, Florida area. We'll have all the racing news on Monday. The racing season's starting, so send me the schedules of series or big events that you think you'd want Shakedown to know about and mention. I got the majors covered, but there may be stuff that I don't know about. Solo events, time attacks in the US and outside, and yes, JF, Targa Newfoundland is a big deal. I hear you're making plans to race it. But guys, spare me the lemons and chump car schedules. Oh, and here's a tease of something I'll be driving at the Sears Point Raceway in early March. 300 horsepower, 900 pounds. Really? It's not a McLaren, and I'm not going to drift, but it will be bloody fast. Thank you in advance, Palatov and Sim Raceway, for making it happen.